Father's Day. I remember one time we did a camp a couple of years ago, and it was a family family camp, and we had the, the children are up there, and and I asked them, you know, how many of you here have perfect parents? Expecting them to say, of course, nobody has perfect parents, but of course, Ryan's son goes, oh, I have perfect parents. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm, I'm not like your dad. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 36, and we're looking at the last seven days of the life of Christ. Ironically, it takes up a third of the gospel of Matthew. Uh, so much of the New Testament is built on the resurrection, the death and what the atoning sacrifice that Jesus made for us and the significance of that event. And so we're taking some time looking at these last seven days, these critical moments, which are carving the way of his path to our redemption. And I pray today that we hear from the heart of Christ, who's shortly, in a matter of three days, would be going to the cross and sitting in an upper room and trying to wrap the disciples' minds around God's plan that they had no idea what was taking place. And today that we would open up our hearts and allow the Lord to prepare us for what He has in store for us as well. So far we've looked at Matthew chapter 21 through 22, moving into 23. It spanned a couple of days and Jesus went down from Jerusalem. It's important to note that while He was there, and He was teaching and sharing, but they just kept bringing people that were sick and, and uh, He was healing them. And in the course of healing people, he was getting the attention of the people and he was sharing critical truths, preparing them for what was about to take place. We've seen the triumphal entry. We've seen Jesus cleansing the temple that when he comes, you can expect him to clean house in our lives. That's what he does. He brings his righteousness. When he's on board, he makes us more like himself. He's committed more to our holiness oftentimes than we are. And I thank God for that because that's what makes us holy. It's his work on our behalf. We talked about the cursing of the fig tree and the importance of bearing fruit in our lives. The, the religious leaders that were questioning his authority, wonder, authority, wondering what right did he have to speak into their lives. And he gave them three parables, the parable of the two sons and the landowner, the wedding feast. We talked about the significance of each of those. How he modeled composure with the issue of taxes. And last week he talked about heaven and how in Christ the best is always yet to come. And our passage today talks about the greatest commandment and how critical a proper response is to this. Because when it's all said and done, what matters most is that we love God and love each other with the best love we have to offer. That sums up the scriptures in one simple phrase. With that, let's turn to the Lord in prayer as we ask Him to speak to our hearts this morning. Father, we sit at the feet of Your Word today in Your presence, acknowledging that You alone have the words of eternal life. And I pray, God, that You would do for us what, what man can't do. Even our own desires can't do. And that is impart Your life into us. That today we would live connected to the vine that is Jesus Christ. And that your word would become real to us. It would literally be food for the soul. And bear the fruit that you intended to yield. And that we would bear your mark in every phase of life. God, to be more like you is what we need more than anything else. We can't do it without you. So we ask now and we invite you to speak to our hearts. And do for us what we can't do for ourselves. And that's make us more like you, Jesus. Grant this we ask in your name. Amen. Matthew 22, 34 to 36 reads as follows. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. And one of them, a lawyer who was an expert in the Old Testament law, asked him a question, testing him. He said, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that moment or that day on Tuesday ask him another question. They just sought to take his life. I want to focus on three things from our passage this morning. The first is the purpose of God's commands. And then Jesus' summary of God's commands. And then the practical fulfillment of those commands in our daily living. So we start with the purpose of God's commands. And first of all, that God's commands or the commandments in the scriptures, number one, are an expression of God's will. What are the commandments? They're God's expressed will for his people. God will never ask us to do anything or require of us anything that's outside of his commands or his laws or his will. And the scriptures teach us three important truths about God's will. You see, God's commands are always good because God's will is always good. Jeremiah 29, 9, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, not to harm you, but plans for your welfare, so you, uh, to give you a future and a hope. You see, regardless of what it looks like or feels like, God's will is always good. And how many of us know that it doesn't always feel like God's will is good? When things aren't going the way we want them to go, we wonder, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Well, God's allowing it to happen because he wants to impart his nature into our hearts and our lives and build his character through these events. God uses everything to accomplish his will in our lives, and his will is always good. And Joseph says that even to the point that he uses evil for his good and for ours. So regardless of what it looks like or feels like, God's will is always good. He makes beauty of ashes. That's the book of Job in a nutshell. Secondly, God's commands are perfect and complete because God's will is perfect and complete. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what the will of God is. That which is what? It's good and acceptable and perfect or complete. You see, each of God's commands are designed to help conform us and make us who we are to be in Christ. That's the purpose of God's commands. God's commands aren't a list of do's and don'ts. We need to see past the do's and don'ts to the heart of what he's expressing. And God's word and God's commands is designed to make us more like him and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. So God's will is a parameter. God's commands are a parameter with which, within which God's blessings are enjoyed. In fact, when God gave the commands in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, this is what he said through Moses. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all the commandments, the things that I'm requiring, the things that I'm asking of you, the things that I desire of you, the Lord your God will set you up above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings will come upon you, and God's blessings will overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. So God's commands are not a negative thing. They need to be seen as God's positive, the boundaries with which God's blessings flow into our lives. They're God's expressed will. Secondly, they express God's heart. You see, and here's what I want us to see, and I think what Jesus is pointing at in our text. Everything God gives us in this book, is designed to establish and build a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. That's the purpose of every design, or of every, every law. 
of every word that is given to us. It's designed to bring us into a personal, dynamic, loving relationship with our Heavenly Father. And that's where the scribes, the religious leaders, and that's where too many people in our world miss it today. You see, the law is more than a system. It's spiritual. It's meant to be a living document. You know, in any any legal document, there is the spirit of what is being said that's more important than the terms themselves. And I think we have it backwards in our world. And that's why we have so many laws. I tried to find out how many laws do we have in California. Did you know, just federally, there's over 20,000 laws just in terms of guns. I couldn't get a number of how many laws there are in California. Just that there's too many probably to count. And, and because there's so many laws, we have all these frivolous lawsuits that put a strain on our economy. And there's all these arguments of words because we don't have enough integrity to submit to the spirit of the law. In fact, I want to ask a question. What's the most ridiculous thing anybody here has ever got a ticket for? What's the most ridiculous thing you've ever got a ticket for? Going 85 and a 25. No, that's not ridiculous. Fix it ticket. Anybody else? Jaywalking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Walking across the street. I got a ticket for crossing the street where they told me I shouldn't go. There you go. Off the fire. <laughs> okay, so we're standing up in the back of a pickup truck. Okay. What was that? Missing registration ticket. Okay, note to self. Okay, get my, my sticker on there. For me, I think the most ridiculous ticket I've ever gotten was washing my car on my front yard. That you're not allowed to park on your grass. And so I got a ticket that I was not willing to pay saying, listen, they just don't want my yard to be a junkyard. I was washing my vehicle. They're going to let me off. $75 later, I was extremely frustrated saying, that is not the spirit of the law. And I say this because, you know, what? We get, when we get lost in the words and just a matter of semantics, we're missing the point of the law. And that's what the religious leaders did. Jesus became, or this, the relationship with God became a matter of a legal system as opposed to a personal relationship. And I bring this up this morning, not to vent, but hopefully help us to see how frustrating as these experiences are for us, how much more frustrating for God it must be to see us continually and constantly misinterpret and misapply the spirit of the law that he's put on our hearts. People are using to rob people or or get in the way of relationship with him using God's word instead of bringing people into fellowship with him. You see, that's what Jesus is getting at into our text. The law is about bringing us into a love relationship with the creator of the universe. Anything beyond that, we've missed it. And it reminds us of three very simple fundamental truths about God and the law and his word. Number one, everything God gives us is out of love. Everything God gives us is out of love. Everything God does for us is out of love. And everything God desires from us is love and response. It's not actions. It's the heart behind the actions, which when God ministers to us there, it always produces the right kind of actions. Now let's look at the summary of the Ten Commandments by Jesus. And here's what he says. First of all, he used something that was very familiar to the people of that day. And it comes from Deuteronomy 6.5. You see, this was often quoted at the beginning of every synagogue service. Every time they went to church, if you will, they're reminded that the Lord your God is one God. And they were to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. In fact, it was something that the most pious of Jews, not all of them, but most of them, 
would recite every morning as they woke up and every night as they went to bed. I think of my, my daughter, who when she was growing up, she would always ask me, Dad, can you pray that prayer over me? I said, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, and the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on, on, on you and give you peace. Bless you in your labor and your leisure. You're rising up, you're going down, and everything you do may be blessed of God. Now, she never knew I was quoting scripture to her. She heard somebody else say that. He even knows exactly what my dad prays all the time. But in the same way, the Jews, when they heard this, they heard it over and over and over again to love the Lord your God with everything you are and everything you have. Like so many things in life, we just need to apply what we already know. Put God first. Love Him, know Him, trust Him, and serve Him. Give Him everything you have. That's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Secondly, it was practical. It was easy to understand and apply. In fact, I was thinking about that this past week. You know, we, we struggle giving up mission statements and all these different things. What can we do to, to minister to more people? Jesus just kept it simple. Here it is. Love God and love your neighbors yourself. You want a mission statement for the church? Go and make disciples of all nations. <laughs> it's pretty simple, practical. You see, what Jesus says here is easy to wrap our lives around. It's the golden rule. In your love for God and your love for others or your neighbors, do to others as you would have them do to you. A simple way to live. You see, love moves us to action. Less talk, more do. Amen? I think that's what the world needs from the church. Less talk, less semantics, and more action. And here it is. If you want more love, be more loving. If you want people to be more kind to you, then, then be more kind to them. If you want peace, then give peace. If you need forgiveness, give forgiveness. If you want a blessing, be a blessing. If you want Christ's likeness, then be Christ's likeness. And give everything you've got toward this end. It was very, very practical. Let's just, in the most simple of ways, be like Christ. Everything we know Him to be, God, would you make that part of my life today? You see, when we shortchange God, we shortchange others, and we shortchange ourselves. Living life less than full capacity. And we all know when we're not all in or not. I think of, in fact, I couldn't get out of my mind this past week as I've been meditating over these verses, and all I could hear is putting myself in the shoes of Peter, and sitting around a campfire and having some fish, that was miraculously provided, just sitting in, in, in awe of Jesus, being raised from the dead, mesmerized, just in, in awe of the situation. And then Jesus looking me in the eyes and saying, Dane, in light of all that I've done for you and all that you've seen and experienced, do you love me? Do you agape me? Do you... Do you do you love me with the highest form of love that's on the face of this earth? I'm like, I don't really want to answer that, Lord. Like, Peter, I, I, I like you a lot, Lord. Three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And as I thought about these verses, I hear the Lord asking me, Dane, do you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, not words, with the very core of who you are, do you love me more than anything else? More than anything else in this world? Have you abandoned yourself to me? And you know what my response has been? Yeah, let's go do it. Not, you know, hey, I wish it were that. My response has been, God, help me. Help me to give you what you deserve because too many times I'm holding back. When I think of what Christ did for me, when I think about what Christ did for the world in just three days, he was going to go to the cross and give his life for the people that were taking it. 
You know, is the life I'm living worthy of the life Christ gave for me? Do you love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? Not a performance-based Christianity. It's a matter of love. Am I loving God with what he deserves? So practical, yet so comprehensive. As such, it's a matter of highest priority and consideration. You see, Jesus' words here aren't lacking in substance. It really isn't oversimplifying things. He says, love the Lord your God, which covers the first four commandments, right? If you you get your relationship with him settled, it'll take care of everything else. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's the next six commandments. You know, I use this principle in marriage counseling on a regular basis. Because the same is true in marriage. If if the husband and wife relationship aren't on the same page, they're, they're not expressing love properly to one another, then the whole home is dysfunctional. Amen? You can't make it up by doing nice things for your kids. The, the center relation, relation in the home is husband-wife. And if we get that right, that peace will disseminate itself to our children. And it's never too late to do the right thing. I know for me, raising up, being raised, and when I saw my parents going at it and the different things, and they've been married now for, I don't know, 60 years or whatever it is, maybe 58, I don't know. But I, I, I'm so grateful for what they have modeled for me and my brothers that life isn't always easy and love isn't always a a cakewalk but love is more powerful than anything else in this world that seeks to destroy it if you do it right and I remember whenever things were shaky in the home that's when me the youngest of four boys I, I felt the most uneasy and struggle with my own identity. There's something about that relationship that brought peace in my own heart. And so it is, we can't bring peace to the world if we're not first at peace with God. And that's what he says here. Love God first. Get your relationship in order with him. And you know what's going to happen? It'll work its way out into your relationships to your brothers and sisters. It starts there and it doesn't stop there. It'll move horizontally to others. Finally, did you notice how personal his response was? He says, love what? The Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You see, God's word is always meant to be personalized. He's speaking to each and every one of us. It's been said that it's not what men eat, but what they digest that makes them strong. It's not what we gain, but what we say that makes us rich. It's not what we read, but what we remember that makes us learned or wise. It's not what we preach, but what we practice that makes us Christian. Francis Bacon. And I think it bears mentioning that what is right ought to always move us to get right. In a shallow world, God challenges us to pause and truly think about eternal things. What is Jesus doing in these final days? He's getting their attention, giving them another opportunity to repent and make things right with the Holy God. In fact, Mark tells us that the this, the Pharisee here, the scribe, the, the expert of the law, which the Gospel of Mark in the movie portrays as Nicodemus, was intrigued by Jesus' answer. And Jesus said, you're not far from salvation. You're close, but you're not there yet. You haven't received completely his word. You know, it's great to be so close, but it also serves as a warning. It's not enough to be so close. It's not enough to get around the cross. It's not enough to champion biblical truths. We need to take them to heart and personalize them and make them our own. 
And that's the fulfillment of God's commands. So we have it summarized by our Lord. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor yourself. And now what does that mean practically? What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind? Well, number one, it means to be loyal to God. You see, love requires loyalty. If you're faithful and devoted to someone or something, you're loyal. And loyalty is most appreciated not because somebody has to do it. It actually comes from a legal term, loyal. Loyal, from the full French. And it means you're obligated by law to fulfill your word. But the kind of loyalty that God is looking for isn't that we're required to by the law. But we're required by our own hearts and sense of connection and bonding to Him. This is why the Scripture says the Lord your God is a what? Jealous God. Who jealously desires the affections of His people, not in a, a bad sense, but in a pure sense. That God loves us so much He's so loyal to us, he desires the same loyalty in return. He's not satisfied with crumbs. He gave his best, and he deserves our best in return. What does Jesus say? If you want to come after me, you need to deny, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. I've done it for you, now you do it for me. In response. His desire is pure, unadulterated relationship with his creation. It's because of his loyalty that he desires or he's constantly and relentlessly in pursuit of us as people. He, he doesn't give up on us because he's loyal. The Bible says when we're faithless, he remains faithful because he desires relationship with each and every one of us. Not from a legal standpoint, but from the heart because God loves us and loves his people. Secondly, loving God is a call for obedience. Joyful obedience. Steve's been talking about that quite a bit in our own personal times. It's not enough to just be obedient to the Lord. He requires joyful obedience. That I don't obey Him and then complain about it. But I have great joy in doing what He's asked me to do. And not trying to fake Him out either. Because <laughs> God knows from the heart. Embracing the process and saying, Lord, I want to find joy in whatever you put before me. What does Jesus say? In this same week, in a few nights, he would be meeting with the disciples sitting in an upper room. And he says, listen, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You're going to do what I say. Why? Because that's what, how love shows itself in joyful obedience. It's what allows us to obey and do what we do with joy. Love. It's the fruit of walking with God. In fact, it's the only way to do it. Galatians 5 says this. How do we not fulfill the desires of the flesh? How do I say no to myself? By walking in the Spirit. By walking in close relation with God. And as I do that, naturally, His fruit is born out of my life. It's joy, called joyful obedience. Loving God demands a vested interest. A vested interest in the God's plan. His purpose and His desire, making that our chief aim in life. I think of the Westminster Confession in the 1600s that resonated with so many for so many centuries. What is the chief aim of man? Glorify God. And don't stop there. And enjoy Him. What, what's our purpose in life? To glorify God and enjoy Him every step of the process or journey. Going all in. It's being committed. In fact, I believe the foundation for a marriage relationship or any long-term relationship is love. I think of boss Bob Pierce, who was a young man, went on the mission field and with YWAM. And as he went and visited the world and began to see the poverty and the, the things people were going through, his heart was broken. He began to see people the way God see them, and he's like, the, it, things can't go on like this any longer. And so he got help, help us to do something about it. And so he came back to the States and began to raise support, and everywhere he went, he would share the need around the world, and he would literally weep, pleading with people to think outside of themselves and meet the needs in the world. It has been said that if the church tithed in America, it would end starvation around the world. 
We at least have the means to do that. Not that the church would, unfortunately. Bob Pierce later on went to found World Mission. Does anybody here sponsor World Mission? I know in the children's ministry we did and do. My parents do. But that's born out of seeing the world the way God sees it, going all in. In fact, he's given his life to meeting the needs of those destitute in this world. In fact, Bob Pierce's prayer was, as God, may my heart break by what breaks your heart, and I find my greatest satisfaction in what brings you satisfaction. That's loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving others as yourself. Finally, love is the foundation of faith. You see, love casts out fear, the scripture tells us. You see, fear and faith don't mix. One will always give way to the other. 1 John 4.18 says this, love drives out or casts out fear. That's what it does. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, it says, love overpowers worry. When we love God and we put our trust in Him, we see worry as an insult. So if I am worried about a situation, it's actually an insult to God. Like He's not going to take care of His people. It's a double-minded man. A worry simply means double-minded. I got my mind on God and I got my mind on, on the world. And it creates this dichotomy. One, if I focus on God, it brings faith. If I take my eyes off God, it brings worry and doubt. Love moves us to trust God fully and sees worry as an insult and says, this has no place in my life. To love God is to trust Him. And to know God is to love Him. And to love Him is to trust and obey Him. That's why love is the greatest commandment in the Scriptures. Because you can't love who you don't know. When He says, a greater love has no man this than laid down his life for his friend. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. He says, you can't do it if you don't know him. How do we know God? Through his word, through his expressed will, through his heart, in his word, responding to that. The more we get to know him, the more we love him, the more we love him, the more we trust him. In fact, I believe the scripture is all about three words. Do you trust me? Do you trust me? When two blind men came to Jesus, and they said, help us, Rabbi, Son of David, heal us. Jesus says, do you believe that I can do this? When the lame were sitting down, he says, I want you to rise up and walk. Do you believe me? Will you take me at my word? Daniel in the lion's den, do you believe me? Do you trust me? The three Hebrew children, do you trust me in the fiery furnace? Peter walking on the water. Take my hand. There's all these calls. Will you place your life in my hands? Do you trust me? Will you give me my rightful place in your life? It's a life of faith. And it's a life that's born out of love. In light of who God is, in light of what he's done, the more I get to know him, the more I want to trust him, the more I want to lay my life bare in his hands. Here's the answer. You want to respond to the greatest commandment? Get to know God. And the more you get to know him, place your life, your entire life completely in his hands. Give up control. Do you trust me? And don't be a backseat driver. Don't be... What do you call it? Companion driver? I don't know. Whatever it is. Get in the back in the trunk and yeah, whatever. (laughs) Get out of the way and let God do what only God can do. Trust him. Love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Take away today. Are we as radical in our love for Jesus as he is in his love for us? Let's give God everything he's asking for and launch into a dynamic, genuine relationship with Him that is built on love, trust, obedience, faith, and grace. Love God and everyone else with all your heart, with all your soul. 
with all your strength. 